Welcome to The Mashroom Show. Now, this week we're talking about life insurance and will writing, death and taxes, and why they're so particularly crucial for landlords. For example, did you know that you can put your life insurance through your limited company? And do you know if you need a will and life insurance? We're going to be talking about the tax implications of your life insurance and how to protect your family with the right will. So stay tuned. We've got all the answers in our conversation with Monica Bradley. So let's make a start with our first guest. It's Monica Bradley, who's the uh, award-winning company director of MB Associates. And you know all about this kind of the whole life insurance area of business, don't you? Tell, just give us a bit of an idea of some of your experience. Yes, I certainly do, Rob. Um, I've had the business for 30 years now. We are um, based in Surrey. We uh, deal with clients up and down the country. And yeah, we do mortgages and protection for each and every client that we deal with. So you know what you're talking about on all of this stuff. Some really massively important information we're going to get through over the next half hour or so. Let's start with the, the, the real basics. How is life insurance linked to mortgages? So it's, it's really linked. Um, back in the day, many years ago, when you took out a mortgage, and it didn't matter whether it was a commercial mortgage, um, a purchase for a residential property, you had to take out life insurance. It was a condition that the banks insisted, and they put that condition in the mortgage offer. And that slackened over the years, but they used to put it in, and you had no choice but to take out insurance. And on a death of um, a client, the payment would go direct to the bank, so they knew they were going to get their money. But that slackened off. So really, it's now the emphasis is very much on the individual or the company to make sure that they protect the loan. So it's, it's really just linked. So when you take out, you're borrowing hundreds of thousands of pounds, it's crazy that you don't think about actually what happens if I'm sick or what happens if I die. Why would you not consider taking a loan out that when you cover your mobile phone or you're very, very happy to cover your pet insurance, but you don't actually think about your own? So I think it's sometimes something because it's not 100% um, compulsory. compulsory, I think now people don't always think about it and they tend to miss it. And the problem is... I mean, if you die, you die, and therefore you don't know what the consequences are, but the consequences for your dependents, for your loved ones, can be massive. It, it really is true. I mean, I've seen this several, several times, and um, particularly if we get a claim, the first thing we do is check quickly to see what cover that policy is in place, but sure is a real problem for dependents if there's no cover in place. Um, the bank mortgage goes on. That doesn't stop. And interest doesn't stop accruing because um, the banks say, we're really sorry you've lost your father, your mother, your sister, your brother. They don't stop charging you interest. So it's a real problem if you haven't taken it out or considered what will happen if you haven't taken it out. Right. OK, so let's talk through a few different scenarios of what people might do and where they might be going wrong. So one is to do with... Uh, people thinking that all they've got to do is transfer the name of the, 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 the mortgage holder over to their dependent and they'll be able to just take that loan over if they pass on. Yeah, I mean, this is a massive misconception in the market. And I think a lot of people think it doesn't, if something happens to unfortunately one of their loved ones, it's a very, very difficult time in the first place. But what they don't realise is they think they can automatically just put that property because that, the, you know, they think that they're actually next in line for the property. They automatically think that's going to um, be passed on to them and the bank will just transfer the mortgage. No, 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 no. It's a very big no. It doesn't work like that. And I think this is something that um, landlords have to really, really consider because they're often building wealth for their families, they're building um, wealth for their um, loved ones, they're building uh, an income, they're building maybe a pension for the future. But it doesn't automatically happen. If something happens to one of them, that mortgage, if there's a mortgage on a property, the bank has got to agree, and that is a whole new application. It isn't even just a case of them saying, give us your name, we'll transfer it to you. The client has to meet the terms and conditions of the bank. And that's anything from credit score 
to an income. So there's whole loads of things to take into consideration. So what can happen then? If, you, if you're in that situation, if you transfer the name over, you die and then your children take that, that loan on and they can't actually meet those terms, what happens? Quite frankly, the, the bank will um, be looking for their money back because obviously if they don't meet the terms and conditions and can't just take the mortgage over, for whatever reason, there will be some reasons why they can't, um, then they will be asked to sell the property. And they might have to sell the property, in which case then they will um, clearly the first charge, the lender will have the first charge, so the money will automatically go back to the bank. So there isn't a choice. That is the biggest problem. If you haven't thought about this and you haven't done it, at least if you've taken out an insurance policy, the children or the dependents, whoever the beneficiaries are, have a choice to pay back that debt and therefore have the asset and the asset can then be transferred to them easily at the land registry because there's no mortgage to take into consideration. There's nothing for a bank to say we can't do it because the bank don't have any charge over it. They, right. So it's 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 complicated if you if you if you run the risk of you know you run the risk of losing that property if you don't cover yourself. And we're going to be talking about wills uh, later on in the show as well. And I don't want to get too much into the will side of things. That, with yourself at the minute, but it's important to have your will tied into all of this, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's important to just think about what it is you want with your properties. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamentally, that's what I'll say to landlords, that actually, what is it you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve an income for yourself for later on? Are you trying to achieve um, some um, equity to hand to your children, your dependents, your wives, your partners, your um, what are you actually trying to achieve? And then when you know what you're trying to achieve, if you've got borrowing on your properties, then I would fundamentally say, look at taking out life assurance to cover those debts so that they can actually be passed on then and the dependents and your beneficiaries really have a choice as to what they do with them. Either they can make their own decision to mm -hmm. sell them if they want to, because let's frankly, let's make, be frank about it, that's gonna, they're going to inherit them, or they can keep them and have an income from them themselves. So is the process complicated? What do you need to do? As a landlord, if you've got a number of properties and you're wanting to make sure that your property covered, properly covered, how do you go about it? Well, if you're a landlord and you own the properties under a limited company, the good and the unique thing is that there is something that you can do which is highly, highly tax efficient. You can actually put your life assurance through your company and it is fully tax deductible. So your corporation tax fully tax deductible. It isn't a benefit in kind. It simply will reduce. So, so whatever premium you pay out of your limited company for that insurance to protect you in the event of death, that is fully tax deductible. So in theory, if you're going to pay £150 a month for your insurance, that nets right down to under £100, depending on the taxpayer you are. So it's very, very cost effective. It's tax efficient and it's allowable. It's a revenue allowable business expense. So you can protect your, you know, yourselves through your limited company. And is it a more complicated thing to set up than standard life insurance? No, it's not. You just need to have a specialist that actually works in this field who will be able to do it for you. It's really quite straightforward. So the limited company is what we call the set law. So they are the owner of the policy, the limited company name. But the life assured is clearly the director. So who is the borrowing? So who is this covering? So they become the life assured. So clearly the life assurance pays out if something was to happen to them. And then the policy gets written in trust and the benefits are written a policy in trust for your beneficiaries are several. There's and, and, and really, it doesn't matter whether it's through a limited company or not, you must put your policies in trust. And the reason for that is, is, is because in the event of a claim, there is no waiting for probate. So when your policy is in trust, it will pay out on... Um, your death certificate going to the insurance company, it will pay straight out. And your money's then, that money is protected from all your creditors, 
from anybody that you owe money, it's protected from them. So it really is in the hands of the trustees because you're giving that, that money to the trustees to look after for your beneficiaries if they're younger. Right. So it, it's, it's not complicated because it's exactly the same questions if you were doing it for your personal and really you would be wanting to put your personal uh, policies in trust too. So th there's an awful lot of different types of life insurance, aren't there? Um, it, does doing this route that you're talking about, does this limit things in any way? No, not at all. Because if you've got, a, um, you put your uh, life insurance through your company, therefore getting your tax um, relief on your premiums, you still, so for example, you say, okay, well, I've got, 500,000 of loans through my limited company, I want to protect them, I'll put that limited company um, life assurance through your company, but you still can have other insurances personal. It doesn't stop you having your sick pay, your critical illness pay and individual cover. It, it really doesn't, It's mm -hmm. not. You, you're not limited to having a certain amount. The only thing you are limited on is sick pay because you can't have 150% of your income or sick pay, otherwise no one would go to work, would they? Uh, no, indeed, that, would, <laughs> that, it, that totally makes sense. Um, but in terms of the, the so the sick pay, sick pay and critical illness cover, you can have those on top of the life insurance? Yes, you absolutely can. So you can have your sick pay to cover. And incidentally, just on that note, if anybody is wondering, everybody should check if you get paid sick pay from your employer, um, because if you don't, the statutory is about £109 a week. So, and that is literally payable for 28 weeks. So it's really important. It's so not very much, is no. it? It's not And you much. absolutely can have it over and above the limited company and your, um, your, your relevant life. And, and is that tax deductible as well? No, not if right. you pay it because you're paying it out of your own salary. You've already paid tax on your salary. So then you pay the premium. So it's deemed as you've already paid tax because you're paying it out of your net pay. Okay. So inheritance tax, let's move on to, to that a little bit, because obviously if you do end up paying 40% inheritance tax, that can be quite a chunky amount of money that we're talking about. Can you protect yourself against that? Yeah, I mean, this is where really anybody looking at inheritance tax planning needs to really seek and look at um, and, and talk to an advisor because with regards to landlords owning their properties under a limited company, the inheritance tax and capital gains tax is very different to um, what if you own it on your own. But the, the answer to your question is, yes, you can. You can take out life assurance when the calculation's done. So you can have the calculation actually worked out as to where you stand. You can only do it as to where you are right now, mm -hmm. because clearly you might build wealth over the next 10, 15 years. But everything like a will should always be updated your your calculation for inheritance tax should be updated but if you were where you are today and you work out roughly what that inheritance tax is likely to be and of course who knows what it could be in the future it can change these things are always changeable as we know via budgets and so on but yes you can protect it and put that in trust so that at least if your kids and your beneficiaries have got to pay a chunky old tax bill to the revenue, which is, I've seen some horrific ones over the years. It's not pleasurable writing out um, a cheque for £250,000 or transferring £250,000 to the HR revenue and customs, is it? So the answer is yes, you can. And so you should really seek to see how much can I, because you can cover it with life assurance. And so that wouldn't be a specific inheritance tax insurance as such, but you would set your life assurance up so that you had enough to cover paying that bill? Yeah, there is something called um, a joint life second death. So basically, if there's um, a, a couple or partners, it's normally paid on, if you're, if you're married, it's paid on the second death because mm -hmm. in between inheritance tax between husband and wife isn't there, but it, on the second death. So it makes actually, it makes the insurance premium a bit cheaper because the risk is on the second person dying, not the first. So, but that's why I say at the very beginning, Rob, you need to really seek um, some specialist help on it. But yes, it is doable. And you mentioned trusts. What, what does that actually mean? How would you set a trust up? What's that, the purpose of that? Well, whenever you're taking life assurance out, you should always put your policies in trust because what you're doing then is 
you're keeping the proceeds that get paid out um, in your bloodline. So, i.e., um, it stays within the bloodline of your family yeah. where you wanted it to go in the first place. But more importantly, it gets paid out quickly. And I don't know whether that, um, anybody listening today has been involved with um, when they've had to maybe complete probate and look after somebody's estate once they've died. It's complicated. Yeah. And if you have to endless wait... Endless forms. Endless forms. And let me tell you, I've seen some probates waiting three years before it's granted. Now, if you had to wait three years to get a life assurance policy out, paid mm. out, that would be painful. And of course, the revenue, once their inheritance tax money straight yes, away, they perhaps. won't wait until you actually get probate sorted, will they? That's exactly right. So it's really important to put the policy in trust. It pays out straight away. It protects the money. It keeps it in your bloodline and it's payable outside the estate. So there's no reason not to. And if you've got lots of policies, people, A, I'd say review them. There's some really innovative things happening in the insurance world now as we, as we move through. And secondly, really make sure because each insurance company do have their own trusts and it doesn't cost to put an insurance policy in trust. Oh, right. OK. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. Is, is this whole process really expensive? Um, if you seek additional trustees and wills, and I think you're going to talk about that later, that's a whole mm -hmm. different ballgame. But in terms of putting it through your own insurance company, they have all got their own trust documents and they won't charge you to do that. OK. And as a kind of a final thought process, then, if, if, if I'm a landlord and I'm thinking, well, I, it sounds complicated, I need to get this sorted out. Can I do this myself or do you really have to go through a broker and have a conversation with somebody like yourself? I would say for sure to go through a broker and have a conversation and just get it right. I mean, these are every situation and everybody's circumstances are completely different. But at least if you know you've talked through the values, you've talked through what cover you've got, you've talked through because many landlords um, that own properties have also got maybe other jobs. So they might have some death in service with their own companies. So I think it's important just to really do an assessment of where you are and to seek professional advice from an advisor. It's always worthwhile, isn't it? Monica, thank you ever so much for coming in. Some fascinating stuff. Monica Bradley. Thank you very much for having me today. Well, I'm joined now on The Mashroom Show by Rob Foyle and you're an expert estate planner. Good afternoon, Rob. Will Indeed. writing, that's what we're talking about now. Indeed. After talking through all the stuff that we just have done with Monica, and I said that we'd be talking about wills, this is the opportunity to, to actually do that. Forward thinking for your finances, what it's gonna mean for your dependents as and when you pass on. Let's start right with the, the basics. What is the point of having a will? A uh, good question, Rob, yeah, yeah. Um, well, believe it or not, uh, sort of 60% of the population don't have a will. Yeah? So I think in the first instance, it's really important that everyone should have a will. Mm -hmm. um, we all have some form of uh, an estate, yeah? whether it be you know, bricks and mortar property, yeah? cash in the bank. Um, through a will, you, know, you can then nominate your executors, you can nominate your beneficiaries. If you have children that are under the age of 18, you can nominate guardians. You can also decide who, you know, what your funeral wishes are, whether you wish to be buried or cremated. So it's really important that, you know, that one should have a will to ensure, you know, that you, firstly that you nominate the correct people, yeah, to be uh, executing your wishes, but also to ensure that the correct people inherit Absolutely. your estate as well. And if you don't have one in place, what can happen? Well, yeah, I mean, another good question. Um, Laws of intestacy could potentially sort of, uh, well, would, would cut in in the first instance. Um, you may have an, an executor administering your estate, um, albeit not the person that you would have wished for or hoped for. Um, and beneficiaries may not necessarily be the individuals that you want them to be, i.e. family members um, or even loved ones. Um, and certainly you wouldn't want the money going to the tax man, would you? <laughs> So, so it's important. Uh, it's so, important so, to have one definitely. in place. And specifically, obviously, we're talking about landlords and how their businesses, their properties, because if you're a landlord, you've got more than one property. So you have to be that much more specific yes. around who you want stuff to go to and how you want it to, to go to them. Yeah, most definitely. And, you know, if, 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 if landlords do have 
know, multiple properties and, you know, most landlords, have, you know, would have their main residence plus additional properties. Uh, it's, it's really key, you know, that they do have a will themselves so they can actually sort of ensure that, you know, that those properties pass through to the family members again, even through to business partners. You know, if they have multiple properties that are sort of owned by a, a business within a business portfolio, then you know what happens to the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, you know, it's very key that uh, you know one should have uh, a will yeah, to ensure that you know the assets pass through to those that they they nominate. And do you, how often do you need to update your will? Uh, as, reg <laughs> as regularly as there is a change in circumstance. Okay, so, um, you know, for, for example, if one gets married, uh, even if one goes through a divorce, you know, that's definitely a good reason or reasons to, um, you know, have the will uh, reconstructed or redrafted. Uh, you may even have a, a newly born child. That would be another reason to include a person. Um, and then as and when people change addresses or um, if there's been a, if you wish to nominate a, a different executor, you know, a different beneficiary, then again, that would be sort of other reasons for making changes to wills. So if you, let, let's sort of wind it back a little bit, if you didn't have a will in place as a landlord and your assumption is that when you die, your portfolio will just automatically go to your children, is that the case? Is, Not that necessarily, no, because you'd have to sort of uh, look at the person's circumstances, personal circumstances. So are they single? Are they married? Okay. Um, if they're married, yeah, typically, yeah, you'd want to leave perhaps everything to your wife. Yeah, through a will, you can ensure that that happens. Yeah, laws of intestacy nominates your wife in the first instance, but then also a share goes through to your children. You may also want to exclude a, a person from benefiting, and instead of it passing through to your wife or partner, you may want to pass it through to your business partner. So again, a will is a good way of being able to sort of, you know, structure what outcomes one requires or one needs. So the, the actual process of, of getting a will, because I know that you can you can potentially go to a news agent and buy one off Where the shelf. Buy them off the shelf, mm. yeah. <laughs> Are they no good? Um, I mean, I, I think, that, I think that, that gap in there, it speaks volumes, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've read the documents myself, Rob, you know, and I've, yeah, I mean, if you want the job done properly, you, you need to speak to a professional person. You need mm -hmm. to speak to someone, you know, who knows sort of the ins and outs, you know, about um, will writing and estate planning. Um, it, it's probably the most important document that you'll probably ever write you know, during your life. So you'll need to make sure that it's up to date, that it's correct. And you want a professional sort of acting on, you know, writing it or, or constructing it for you. So inheritance tax, that's one of the, the key areas that we really want to kind of look at. Yes. And how having a will will actually help you manage that side of things. Yeah, I mean, in, in, inheritance tax, unfortunately, it, it, is, it is a tax that, you know, becomes payable, um, you know, upon death. And uh, we all have some form of inheritance, to, potential inheritance to, to pay in the future. Um, if you own, um, if, if you're a single person, um, you know, like myself, you know, with no children, uh, with property, my sort of threshold would be 325,000. Um, if you've got any, a single person, um, you know, with property, with a child, their allowance would be 500,000. Um, if you've got a, a married couple with property uh, and children, again, their, their allowance would be £1 million. Pounds. So there's not a lot of sort of um, room, shall we say, for um, sort of tax efficiency. So if you're a landlord and you've got, and, and you've more got than multiple property, properties, there's, there's, and those estates, you know, those properties are, you know, three, four hundred thousand pounds a piece, and, you know, even larger, in, depending on the part of the country that one comes from, then, um, you know, you can suddenly, you know, you're over that one million pound threshold. And then it's 40% on everything and over that, isn't it? then you need, correct, yeah. And that's payable That's payable to the tax man rather than in advance, once the probate sorted Correct, out. yeah. So one has to sort of, you know, raise those funds before the, um, you know, um, the, the estate is then distributed amongst the beneficiaries. So having a will, does that help you manage that? It certainly does, and it, and it does sort of quicken up the process as well. Um, 
in, in being able to sort of, you know, you're appointing the people that you want to have control your estate. Yeah. Um, you may decide that you want to have a, a professional executor administer your estate. But as long as it's clearly documented and, and, and constructed through the will as to what your wishes and outcomes are and who the uh, appropriate people would be to manage your sort of affairs upon your death, um, and you've done the correct sort of planning in the first instance, Rob, that's probably the most important mm -hmm. thing. Um, properties, you know, your assets, you can have an estate which is more tax efficient if you do sort of smart, clever things. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Such that, as? And, and that's where you sort of, you know, where we sort of come into our own, where we can sort of talk to clients and we can sort of give them advice and guidance on ways of sort of holding the property, you know, perhaps as tenants in common, mm -hmm. yeah, instead of owning the property jointly. Yeah. Um, and if the properties are owned with, within business, um, within the business, who are the shareholders of the business? Who, who are the key stakeholders of, of that property, of, of, the, of that business? So again, through, um, so through the will and incorporating the appropriate um, clauses, um, you can then sort of take advantage of, of the sort of in, in inheritance tax threshold. But unfortunately, it is a tax that you know, we all have to sort of pay. If we can reduce it, fantastic, yeah. Um, there are, you know, like there are life insurance policies, as you probably have heard in, on previous shows as well, where you can take out life insurance mm -hmm. to pay off an inheritance tax liability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because forty percent over monarchy, yeah. forty percent over, you know, one hundred thousand uh, over one million pounds, um, suddenly, you know, could become a substantial be, amount. Indeed, it can. You know, indeed, and it can. By taking a, you know, a whole of life policy, as, as, as Monica's sort of referred to earlier, there. Um, that's a good way of being able to sort of uh, have funds available by the family members to pay that liability. Now, one of the and other you things... you can't sell a property to pay for the tax liability. <laughs> so one of the other things that I did want to talk about very briefly is um, power of attorney. Uh, a lot of uh, landlords, obviously, we know are uh, older and will be uh, leaving the market one way or the other at some point. Yep. Unfortunately, a proportion of people will have um, men mental illnesses or dementia coming in, and you have to have that power of attorney to actually have some kind of control of what's going on. How does that affect your thought processes around planning and writing a will? Yeah, so that's um, lost in power of attorney. Um, again, you know, I, I, I sort of, Look at a person's estate, and I look at it in, as, as three pieces, you know, within a jigsaw. So, you know, first of all, you've got sort of will writing. Um, with wills, you can also do trust work, you know, and that's where you can then be sort of more tax efficient by sort of doing trust work. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece of the jigsaw is, is is the lasting power of attorney, because you can't write a will if you don't have capacity. And you can't have LPAs if you don't have capacity. So in the event of one losing capacity for, for whatever reason, whether it be a stroke, um, an RTA, yeah, old age, you want to make sure that you've appointed an attorney, a family member, maybe a loved one, your partner, your spouse, whoever it be, to then manage your affairs. So if you own a property portfolio um, and you are managing those properties and you lose capacity, who's going to take over that responsibility mm -hmm. of managing those properties? How can you sell a property if you don't have capacity to sign a document? So you need to get yeah. that power of attorney in place sooner you rather need to than be later. doing it at the same time as doing wills. Mm -hmm. And that's what I say to you know all of my clients is that it, it's about, you know, you get a one-time opportunity. If you get it right now, you don't need to worry about it for the rest of your life. Obviously, review your circumstances every, you know, as when there is a change. Yeah. And always, you know, I always think about, you know, I always talk about a two year timeline. Every two years, it's always a good reason to then pull out those documents and have a look. Yeah. See what changes there mm -hmm. has been in your, mm -hmm. your own personal circumstances, but also, you know, with everyone else around as well. And is it an expensive process to go through? Depends what one wants, Rob. Well, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's probably one I mean, of those things you know, as well. You, you, it's, you are, it's not as expensive as the alternative if you don't do it. Yeah. And, and you know, you're, you, you mentioned there, you know, there are. Um, 
services that you can purchase over the internet. Um, you know, as you said there, you know, you can go into WH Smith and, and buy a wheel kit. Yeah. Um, you have to ensure, you know, that the documents and the person that you're consulting with, yeah, you know, that those outcomes are mirrored together, that you're both on the same sort of sheet together and you're, what you want to have happen, yeah, is down to the wheel writer and the state planners. And that will actually make it happen. Expertise to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, Great. And, you know, and that, that, that's, uh, you know that's, that's really important to everyone. Lovely. Well, it's been really fascinating having a chat with you. We could carry on for an awful lot. I'm sure we could. Indeed, other stuff, but yeah. uh, Rob Foyle, expert in, uh, in will writing and future planning. Thank you very Thank much for being much. with us. Lovely. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. And now for the latest landlord news. Could an exodus of landlords leaving the sector tank house prices? Well, we've been hearing a lot about landlords deciding to sell up in recent months, but that may not just have implications for the rental market, reducing supply and driving up rent for tenants. There are warnings it could have a deep impact on the value of your property. The Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors has reported that they've seen a drop in interest from UK-based investors over the last six months. And according to rating agency Moody's, house prices will fall by 10% in the next two years, driven by persistent high inflation and the consequent spike in lending rates. Landlords are under an increasing amount of financial pressure, not just from mortgage rates but also from new regulatory requirements that may mean potentially expensive improvements to their properties. Raising rents is one way to meet those rising costs. Currently, they're going up by around 5%, but according to Bank of England estimates, rents would have to go up by almost 20% to fully cover costs. It's unlikely that most tenants will be able to afford that kind of increase while they're also balancing higher bills, meaning landlords would then have to worry about the potential rent arrears and possible eviction. No wonder so many landlords are choosing to sell up rather than face the risks, but it does impact the housing market as a whole. There are fewer buy-to-let mortgages to choose from at the moment. It's not the mass withdrawal that we saw after last year's disastrous mini-budget, but some lenders are withdrawing their products as average fixed rates go up. Since late May, we've seen the number of buy-to-let products drop from 2,748 to 2,343. And at the same time, the average rate on a two-year fixed buy-to-let mortgage has gone up to 5.61%. The average rate on a five-year fixed has gone up to 5.52%. William Delaney at Coopers of London Limited says that the dysfunctional court process in possession cases, egregious tax and compliance measures and interest rates are all taking their toll. No doubt landlords will then be blamed for soaring rents and lack of supply. However, it doesn't mean that there are no options. For instance, Paragon Bank has recently launched a range of limited edition buy-to-let mortgages. So it's definitely worth speaking to your broker, especially if they're a buy-to-let specialist like Masham Mortgages. Now news that a petition has been launched to try and save assured shorthold tenancies. The new rental reform bill is proposing to change current ASTs which run for a year, which would see them become periodic. For many landlords, this throws up a lot of worries about potentially high tenant turnover, which could increase costs for landlords. One landlord based in the north of England, Adnan Uddin, has launched a parliamentary petition asking the government to drop these plans from the new bill, saying, I genuinely feel that this will not do anything to stop bad landlords, but will increase issues with tenants who can choose to leave whenever they want with a minimal notice period. We'd love to hear your thoughts on potential changes to standard ASTs. Do you think they would be good or bad for the sector? And are you worried about the possibility of the new periodic terms coming in? Well, we're joined on The Mashroom Show now by Kirsty Prima. Hello, Kirsty. Kirsty's one of uh, Mashroom's... Mortgage experts, is that yeah, the best way of putting it? mortgage and protection. It? Mortgage and protection experts. So we've been talking about um, the importance of, of protecting your legacy, effectively. Mm, absolutely. This, this episode. Walk us through the, the process of um, securing 
life insurance? Is it a complicated thing to do? Um, it's not complicated if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, however, you can get caught in a trap where you don't necessarily know what route you're taking. So it's always best to speak to an advisor. We have um, a number of leading insurers on our panel um, and they offer lots of different different quirks and, and different parts and they'll suit different people's needs. So one insurance might be really good at covering a certain condition while others might not be. Um, so the process to get life insurance would be to speak to an insurance advisor. They'll be able to recommend the best thing for you, run for a medical questionnaire, ask some information um, and the insurer might need to get a GP's report or they might need a bit more information. So it's not quite as simple as you put things in a computer and something comes out, there's a lot more, more to it and that's what I'm here to help advise them. Absolutely, because it is quite personal, some of the information, Oh, isn't absolutely, it? absolutely. Mm. And, you know, there will be times where I have to ask some personal questions and, and things like that. However, it is something I do very regularly, so it's not something I, you know, I, I take a lot of um, scope Notice into looking no, at, no, no, notice into looking at. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot that I've seen, and but there's, there's been some really... Great things that I've managed to cover people who never thought they would get insurance um, and seeing the peace of mind is, is really lovely actually. It's a really nice part of the journey. Good, 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 good. Okay, so what about timing? At what point do you need life insurance? I'd say there's probably not a point where you don't need life insurance. In life there's one certainty. Well, there's two. There's, there's, you will be Death taxed. Death taxes, yeah. There you go. Um, but... I'd say for me, although it's not a condition of a mortgage anymore to have life insurance, I would say it's an absolute essential as a minimum to have life insurance when you, you have a property, um, especially if you've got family, partners, people that you want to leave that legacy to. Mm -hmm. A lot of people become landlords because they want to leave a legacy to somebody. Why would you want to leave that with a big debt? The life insurance gives you the reassurance that you can leave your family in a really great position when the worst happens. So... We've talked in, in previous episodes about the, the importance of making sure that your kind of property cover is kept up to date. Mm. And if you were doing renovation work, for instance, yeah. that you need to inform your insurer. Is it a similar thing with life insurance? If you have like life events that you need to let your life insurer know about, about that? You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. Once you've got the policy, it's, it's normally set at a rate for a certain period of time. That's called a guaranteed premium. That's generally what's offered on, on life insurance terms. However... I would always review it every time I review a mortgage. So for me, I review my own life insurance every two to five years whenever I'm re-looking at the fixed rate. So I tend to go for a fixed rate. I'm pretty risk averse. So I will always review mine then just to see if there's anything cheaper out there, if the conditions have changed. Some older life insurance policies are actually better to keep because they cover more conditions or they cover more generalised things than what, what insurances could potentially do now. So again, it's... I've got the the tools and the skills to be able to look at what what cover is right for that person at that time compared to their life events and things that have happened. Now, obviously, we were chat, having a chat with uh, Rob a few minutes ago about wills. Mm. Um, do you have to have the same beneficiaries on your life insurance that you have in your will? No, you don't. Right. Um, so life insurance works differently in that sense. I would always recommend if you've got life insurance to put it in a trust. Um, if it's then put into a trust, it pays out before the will. Um, it, it generally pays out within a week or two of the event happening, which means that the mortgage can then be cleared, specifically if it is for mortgage um, mortgage purposes to get that re reassurance earlier. So no, you don't have to, you can do. There's no, you know, there's no good or bad way, mm -hmm. but no, it doesn't have to be. And are there complications if they are different? No, not generally, because it's done separately to to the uh, probate and the, and the will part. All right. OK, fascinating. Well, Kirsty, thank you ever so much for Lovely. running through those things. And as always, in general terms, if you've got questions about this stuff, I think people, you can just ring up and ask. Give me a call. <laughs> Kirsty Plummer. Well, that's it for the Mashroom Show this week, but there is... Plenty more to come, as always. We'll be back on Friday the 30th of June for more landlord tips and insights. Don't forget uh, to follow us online. Please join our Facebook community. And if you want to listen to the show again, then keep an eye on your inbox as the recording should be with you shortly. But for the moment, it's goodbye for now. And we'll see you again on the 30th of June.